I wanted to make very clear that I'm not talking about do things that are you focused. Do things that are, invest yourselves into things that are Christ focused and that reach out beyond just yourself. Usually when people vote, they say who's gonna be the best person for me personally. And if you wanna trickle it down to your kids, those who have kids, they think about that. But when we invest ourselves as Christians into the world, just as God invested himself through Christ into the world and into us, he went beyond just himself. He thought and reached out to the world. He reached out to us. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about the importance of not just being political, but making sure that politics doesn't become an idol for us. Back in, in late 2007, Every single time I turned on the TV, who was on the TV? This man was speaking. Every single time. Every single time. I turned on the TV, this man was on TV. And not to outdo do Trump, but he, this man, drew the biggest crowds I've ever seen. Bigger than Trump, okay? These were big crowds, and I mean, again, they were the biggest crowds, okay? Trump always says, you've never seen crowds, crowds like this, okay? It's true, they're the biggest. This man, man, people, I, I was blown away. Anytime this man went anywhere, tens of thousands of people would show up to hear Barack Obama speak. Several times, I would turn on the TV, and what I would see, and you can't, if you could flip the lights in the back, this is what I saw. I saw people coming on the screen, and they would show, it was actually beautifully orchestrated by the media. Uh, it's just just the, the lights will be fine. Beautifully orchestrated, it's fine, it's fine. Beautifully orchestrated by the media, you would see people crying, Hi. coming across. And it was, it, was, it was wonderful. But as if, like, this man was going to, they, he was going to save them. People put such extraordinary amounts of faith in this man. Usually... After a president is elected, what happens? People start naming their kids after, after the president. The Social Security Administration noted that the number of Barack's in this country jumped 1,000% from a whopping 7 to 52 people in 2008. I mean, it was huge. It was huge. I'm being a little bit sarcastic. But it went from 7 to 52 up to 69, and then it kind of came up. Barack Obama, I mean, maybe Barack's not the most popular name to name your child. But aside from that, I mean, this man was, he was like the second coming. People put so much faith into this man and what he was going to do. Maybe it was just his name that was the problem. But people all over the world tend to make idols out of their government leaders. You got the royal family. You've got President Sisi. I remember when he was first elected, Sisi was going to save the Christians. There was going to be peace all over. Vladimir Putin was going to rebuild Russia. In America, it was Barack Obama. Before that, it was George Bush. Next, we'll see. <laughs> But the expectation is that the leader is going to save them. And that what we end up doing is we end up investing ourselves into something called an idolatry of power. We are drawn to power, and we find this, by the way, to be fair, in the, the example that you gave, we find this happening in churches as well. People idolize influence and power, whether in church or in corporations or in neighborhoods, or in government. People tend to idolize power. Whatever the case, no matter the country, as Christians, we need to make sure that we don't make politics our idol. Okay? Things you might say if you have committed political idolatry. Let me give you five things you might say if you have committed political idolatry. Number one, if Hillary wins, it's all over. America's done, okay? Just like in Egypt a few years ago, if Morsi is elected, Egypt is all done. 
Number two, if Trump wins, Jesus must be coming soon. We're living in the last days. Number three, if Hillary wins, God is bringing judgment to America. Number four, you think unless you get a perfect Christian candidate in office, God can't accomplish his work. Number five, you talk, study, and think about the current political issues more than God or your Bible. For that matter, you have more passion for politics than sharing your faith or making disciples. This is the person, when they wake up, the very first thing they do, like I mentioned in the discussion, is they check the political average of polls before they would even stand up and have a morning prayer uh, or read the scriptures. All right? Earlier this week, I received an email from uh, a sister named Sandra from San Antonio. This was last Tuesday. She had listened to last Sunday's talk, and she sent me the following quote. Okay? This is from a book by Tim Keller called Counterfeit Gods. So many people respond to U.S. political trends in such an extreme way. When either party wins an election, a certain percentage of the losing side talks openly about leaving the country. I've heard that so much this election cycle. They become fearful, number one, they become fearful for the future. God has not given us a spirit of fear. They have put the kind of hope in their political leaders' policies that once was reserved for God and the work of the gospel. In addition, the increasing political polarization and bitterness we see in US politics today is a sign that we have made political activism into a form of religion. We identify something besides sin as the main problem with the world and something beside God as the main remedy. That demonizes something that is not completely bad. Neither Trump nor Hillary are completely bad. Neither the Republicans or the Democrats are completely bad. Okay? So it says we demonize something that is not completely bad and make an idol out of something that cannot be the ultimate good. Okay? This is political idolatry. Three things that he highlights that I think are, are important. Number one is that it causes us to live in fear. It causes us to live in fear. John 16, verse 33. These things are spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. What happens if the candidate you don't want gets elected? You're going to live in fear? You're going to live in fear for the next 10 days that the other guy or gal might get elected? In the world, you will have tribulation. Number two, we lose the gospel. What happens is we lose the gospel. We put something else other than God as the ultimate good. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it's the power of God. People look at the Christian message and they say, that's foolish. A crucified God? You're out of your minds. There's no power there. We say, no, 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 no. It is the power of God for those who are being saved. We lose the gospel. We lose the power of hope, the message of hope in the life, the death, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the person of Jesus when we put someone else as the ultimate good and something else other than sin as the ultimate evil. And number three, we bend to political leaders. We bend to political leaders. We end up giving in to what they might want. How many people here, please don't raise your hands. <laughs> How many people here are registered as Republicans and you wholeheartedly commit yourself to everything that the Republican Party stands for? On the flip side, how many of you are registered Democrats? And commit yourself to everything that the Democratic Party commits itself to. Either side has all sorts of corruption in it. All sorts. 
The problem is, once you get committed to a person or a party, other than the person of Jesus and the, if you want to call it the family of God, the party of God, the family, the church, whenever you commit yourself to something else, what happens is you will bend yourself to align yourself within this certain system in order to get on and, and move up. The person who did not do that in the scripture was a man by the name of John the Baptist. If you guys remember, if you guys remember the story of John the Baptist, in Matthew chapter 14, he meets with Herod and Herod's wife. Her name is Herodias. What goes on in that chapter? Verse 3 to 8. Let me read it for you. Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Why? Because John says, sorry, you can't marry your brother's wife. You just can't do it. Okay? He said, I don't care who you are. I don't care what influence you have. You just, you, you can't. I'm committed, John the Baptist saying, I'm committed fully to Christ, to God, the teaching. Okay? My commitment is not to you, Herod. You got power, you got influence. He said, I'm not bending to political power. I'm not bending to political power. And so what ends up happening, you guys know the rest of the story. Herodias brings her daughter on the birthday party. Herod says, whatever you want. Even up to half my kingdom, I'll give it to you. Because all his friends were there. And so he now bends to a different type of influence. Okay? But it was still political. It was still political. And ultimately she dances, seduces. And then she says, at the request of her mom, I want the head of John the Baptist on a plate. Bring me the head on a plate. Many people are more committed to their political parties in the kingdom of God. I've said it so many times. The Democrats are pro-death with abortion and euthanasia. And they're anti-war, supposedly, up until recently. Our Nobel Peace Prize winning president has expanded the wars. But let's just give the Democratic Party their position of being anti-war. Okay? And the Republican Party is pro-death with war but they claim to be anti-abortion when it's, I think, politically expedient for them to do so. The problem is when we become more committed to a party or a person, we let ourselves get seduced into that system that is, I think, broken on both sides. And what we end up doing is we sacrifice the gospel. We sacrifice the message of the scripture. Because we want to be part of the winning team. Listen, folks, every 8 to 12 years, every 8 to 12 years, the team changes. That's what happens. So every 8 to 12 years, if you align yourself with one of these parties, you'll be a winning, you'll be on the winning team. And then the next time, you'll be on the losing team. Okay? Problem is, when we do that, we sell ourselves short of the gospel. When we commit ourselves to a party, or a person other than Christ. When I was in uh, Egypt back in September, I had a conversation with this guy named Jason from Christianity Today. He's a, a journalist there. And he was asking us, myself and one of the other people there, what is our position as a church on how we engage with politics? And what we made it very clear was that we are to speak into the system prophetically, but we have to avoid getting sucked into the system. And one of the passages we did discuss was Revelation chapter 18. Okay? And specifically verse 4, and I pulled this out, I said very clearly, like, God is calling the church out of Babylon. Verse 4, he says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. When we commit ourselves wholly, we sell ourselves wholly to a system that's broken, we share in her sins. It is critical for us to commit ourselves to principles over parties or people. As Christians, you commit yourself to a principle, to an idea, to a teaching, not to a person. The only person we commit ourselves to is our Lord Jesus Christ. We're his disciples. That means if there is an idea that is contrary, that comes out of 
this party's, whatever party's platform or this person's mouth, if it's contrary, I can't accept it. Okay? Because my commitment is to Christ. My commitment is to Christ. Christians do not look to the leader for salvation. Salvation only comes from God. I will never forget, I don't know who the person was that did it, but it was shortly after Sisi was elected in Egypt. I don't know if you guys remember this. He visited the cathedral, and people were like celebrating as if Jesus himself walked into the church. And I actually remember hearing, again, I don't know remember who it was, but someone said, Jesus visited us today. I was like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> Salvation does not come from any leader of any country. We don't look to the, the, the president, the kings, the princes. We don't look to them for salvation. Salvation, folks, comes only from God. Every leader will ultimately fail us. While it is important to participate in the political system, we cannot let it become an idol in our lives. We just can't. If you have your Bibles, please turn them to Psalm 146. 146. All right. In Psalm 146, oh, uh, it is one of what is referred to as the Hallel Psalms, or the Psalms of Praise. It begins with Praise be to the Lord, ends with Praise be to the Lord, Alleluia, Alleluia, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. However, okay, it begins in that way, ends in that way. And as it begins in verse 3, as we heard earlier from our sister, Psalm 146, verse 3 says, Do not put your trust in princes. Not the son of man in whom there is no help. Every leader will ultimately fail us. Every, without question. Without question. Don't expect government leaders to be your salvation. Salvation comes from God alone. Okay? Every leader also fails in comparison to God. There is no politician more powerful than God. John Chrysostom himself, beautiful story about John Chrysostom, is at the end of the 4th century, he's the Bishop of Constantinople. He is the, the church he's leading is called the uh, Church of Wisdom, Hagia Sophia. The Empress, her name is Eudixia, is jealous of John Chrysostom because of his influence over her husband. Yeah. And she's angry because he will not give in. He's uncompromising against sin and vice. He took a very hard stand against this. In the 5th century, there's this man, his name is Socrates of Constantinople. He writes uh, a work, this is actually a painting, a 19th century painting uh, of... John Chrysostom confronting Eudixia, all right? And in this passage, Socrates says the following, and he's talking specifically about a silver statue that the empress wants to build, or actually built, in front of the church of the Hagia Sophia. Listen to what he says here. This is Socrates speaking about Chrysostom. At this time, a silver statue of the empress Eudixia, covered with a long robe, was erected upon a column, supported by a beautiful lofty base. And this stood right next to the church named Sophia. At this statue, public games were accustomed to be performed. These games, John being Chrysostom, regarded as an insult offered to the Church of God. And having regained his ordinary freedom and keenness of tongue, he had been exiled, and he had come back at this point. So now he has regained his confidence to speak. He says here he employed his tongue against those who tolerated them, okay? who tolerated the games and the statue. Chrysostom, he's, also, he's referred to as the golden mouth, okay? the golden tongue. Although it would have been proper to influence the authorities to discontinue the games, he didn't do this. He ridiculed, rather, such practices. The empress took it personally, as indicating marked contempt towards her own person. She therefore endeavored to move another assembly of bishops against him. 
When John became aware of this, he delivered in the church a celebrated sermon commencing with these words. And listen to what he says about the Empress Eudixia. He says, again, Herodias, Herodias, who just a couple of slides ago we talked about, had John the Baptist beheaded. Again, Herodias rages. Again, she's troubled. She dances again and again desires to receive, receive John's head on a platter. And so after this, John is exiled. Once again, he ultimately he dies while he's in exile. Earthly authority figures will come and go, but God sits on the throne. And he always remains there. And that's the one to whom we remain committed. In verses 4 and 6, we continue in Psalm 146. It says, His spirit departs, he returns to his earth, and that very day his plans perish. He's talking here about the princes, right? The kings, the presidents, the leaders. Ultimately, these people are going to die. They return to the earth, and that very day his plans, whatever plans they had, they perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, his help, whose hope is in the Lord, his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is there in them. A Christian who walks with the Lord and keeps constant communion with him will rejoice, they'll remain thankful, they'll give thanks. Our great God dwarfs any political leader. That's how it Every one of them will return from dust to dust. Okay? Our king remains as always. Proverbs 21 verse 1 tells us that the heart of the leader is actually in the hands of God. We are servants not of a system but of a person, of the true king. We are servants of God, not slaves to politics. And so as a result, we are kingdom builders, not nation builders. Our commitment is to build the kingdom of God, not to build the nation of Egypt or the nation of the United States or the nation of China or the nation of Russia or any nation. Our commitment in this world is as kingdom builders. We build the kingdom of God within the land in which we live. That means regardless of where Christians are, they're building the kingdom of God in that nation, and the byproduct of it is it actually benefits the nation. Because the principles of the kingdom of God are righteousness. They're justice. There's some of the things that you discussed during the discussion section. Those are principles of the kingdom. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 tells us, if we were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand, set your mind on things above, not on things of earth. It says, don't set your things on the nation, set your eyes on the kingdom. Stay focused on that. Notice God's heart in verse 7 to 9 of Psalm 146. He is a God of justice, which means that we, as his hands in the world and his feet in the world, should do all that we can to promote justice too. God doesn't promote justice just by going, let, let it be. He works through his church. He works through his people who also promote justice. How do we do this? We do this, verse 7, Psalm 146, verse 7, by protecting the oppressed. Protecting the oppressed. Those who are oppressed, whether spiritually, you protect those people. You protect the church that is the persecuted church in the Middle East and all over the world. That means if there are people also living amongst us that are oppressed by a system, we do what we can to protect those people. The second thing that he mentions is feeding the hungry, which was also mentioned during the discussion section. Okay? Feeding the hungry. There are those who are spiritually hungry and those who are politically in need of those of the body of Christ to get involved to make sure that they are able to eat. That we should be a political force as citizens to feed other citizens. <laughs> the idea of having a soup kitchen, like I, I, I pray to God when we have our own building the things that we'll be able to facilitate and do, but in the meantime we try to do our little part to go out to feed 
But that once a month is not enough for us as a community, I think, or as members, to feed those who are in need. I, I am blown away how numb I and others around me have become to those who are starving physically. Don't forget Jesus, when he went to feed people spiritually, he fed them physically as well. And it wasn't just, okay, let me feed them physically so they'll listen to me speak. No, he fed them because they were in need. Okay? There was no strings attached. Please don't tell me you think every person that ate of the 5,000 men, and not mentioning the women and children, who ate physically that day, every one of them listened to the sermon. Every one of them was laser focused on what Jesus was saying. No. He fed them. They were hungry. Verse 8 talks about bringing both physical and spiritual healing to others. Verse 8 also speaks about exalting those with character, not just with those with wealth and power. Verse 9 talks about providing help to those who are outside of our personal circles, providing help to widows and orphans, and halting wickedness. Christians do not look to the leader of their country for salvation, because salvation only comes from God, but Christians in the world are supposed to be a source of the hands of God in the world, bringing life to others, helping others, healing others. Okay. Next week, next week. So today we focus ultimately on avoiding political idolatry. Okay? We said that we don't look to the leader of the country for salvation, because salvation comes only from God. Next week, we're going to discuss the source of our unity as a church. Should we as Christians be united behind a specific party? Is the Republican Party really the party of Jesus? I'll tell you, growing up in the South, that's what I always heard. All right? And that's what we'll talk about next week. Thank you.